certainly isn't enough time to kick off the uh, further debate, so I think it's time we just move into member statements. And the first member statement this morning goes to Ah, the member for Humber River Black Creek has a statement this morning. Thank you, Speaker. You know what's been missing from this government's throne speech? Any leadership on the growing crisis in insurance in Ontario. Cars were parked during the lockdown and accidents were down over 70 percent across the province. But rather than make insurers share their savings with Ontario drivers, who, by the way, pay the highest rates in North America, this government allowed them to keep them. All $3.6 billion in profits they made in 2020 while everyone else struggled. Even worse, auto insurance rates continue to climb. Any leadership by the government here? No. They were busy doing PR for the insurers. And while restaurants and other small businesses have had their doors closed and struggled to keep their businesses afloat, insurers jacked up premiums by two or three hundred percent. Think about it. Businesses were closed and nobody was there, but their rates tripled, further adding to insurer profits. After all our small businesses have gone through, was there any leadership from the government on rising commercial insurance? No, just silence. Condominium insurance continues to rise, affecting the cost of housing. But is the government taking any action? No. Entire industries are on the point of collapse because insurers, after all the profits they are making, are pulling out of some sectors. After 50 years of service, Burlington Taxi has closed its doors forever because of insurance costs. Truck drivers are facing similar treatment. Music venues facing a whopping 4,000 percent increase, meaning live music could go silent, just like this government when it comes to holding insurers to account. Speaker, day after day, during the afternoons in this chamber, I raise the issue of insurance to government members, and all I get is dodgeball or silence. There is a growing crisis in insurance, and this government needs to step up or step aside. Thank you. Thank you. The next member's statement goes to the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And without a shadow of a doubt, I rise today in this House to acknowledge the unfortunate passing of world-famous weather prognosticator Wyerton Willey. He passed away after almost five years of best-of-the-borough service. I want to extend my sincere condolences to the municipality of South Bruce Peninsula, the people of Wyerton, and people across the country for their loss of our Canadian icon. I spent a lot of my life in Wyerton and have fond memories of Groundhog Day celebrations. I was even the event director in 1999, the year of the first official demise of Willie. For many years, community builder R. Keith Davidson has jokingly referred to me as Wyerton Billy, a name I wear without a shadow of a doubt with pride and honour. Wyerton Willie is a beloved figure in my riding and across the globe. Every year, people across the world gather to celebrate Groundhog Day to see and hear Willie's prognostication. Whether he will see his shadow, heralding six more weeks of winter, or if he does not, indicated an early spring. Will he or won't he, Mr. Speaker? Well, there are other groundhog prognosticators such as, such as Punxsutawney Phil, Shubanakity Sam, Jimmy the Groundhog, Dunkirk Dave, Staten Island Chuck, and Balzac Billy. Wyerton Willie is a special one because he is the world's only albino prognosticating groundhog. Groundhog Day began in 1957 when a Wyerton local named Mac McKenzie decided that his community could use a winter wake-up and Mac put us on the map. With a group of friends and a Toronto journalist, Mackenzie went looking for a groundhog, but instead found a white fur hat and threw it into the hole, and the rest, as they say, is history, Mr. Speaker. Today, more than 60 years later, Wyatt continues to celebrate with a live event that is broadcast around the world and has become one of Ontario's largest winter festivals. The event is a testament to the great people of Wyerton and the festive spirit of small-town Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Premier Ford has attended the festival twice, the only sitting Premier to ever attend, and I know he was impressed with people's friendliness and community spirit in the great riding of Bruce Gray and Sound. I look forward to attending the upcoming festivities, and I invite all members and everyone listening to visit our little piece of paradise on February 2nd for Groundhog Day and to see if Willie won't or Willie will see his shadow. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Wyerton Billy. <laughs> the next member's statement goes to the member from London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Londoners are finding it increasingly difficult to find somewhere they can afford to live. The average price of rent has increased by 7 per cent. Home ownership is out of reach for 80 per cent of renters, and homeless Londoners are dying at an unprecedented rate of one person per week this year. We are in a housing crisis. There are real-life consequences if we don't act quickly to address the unsustainable rising cost of housing. One constituent wrote me saying, quote, I am a senior who collects OAS. I cannot afford the high cost of renting an apartment in London because I am collecting a monthly pension. Supportive housing is not applicable for me because of the long wait list. 
I am afraid I will be pushed into homelessness with no place to live." End quote. It's not only renters, but also homeowners on fixed incomes like pensions and ODSP and OW can't keep up with home repairs, upgrades, but also can't afford to sell and downsize either because, of the, co because the cost of both is too high. With a shortage of at least 3,000 affordable units, there are also few affordable places for the lowest income lenders to live. Recently, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation data shows that there are only 30 units per thousand renters earning less than $36,000. We need a provincial housing and homeless strategy. Housing is a human right. So I ask this government, what is this government's plan to keep folks like my constituents for, to keep folks like my constituents so they can keep a roof over their head? Thank you, Speaker. The next member's statement is the member from Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Protecting our loved ones and ensuring our seniors receive the care they deserve is at the center of everything our government does. In March, our government made an historic investment in 80 long-term care projects across Ontario, including one in my riding of Markham Unionville. This month, I was pleased to attend the groundbreaking ceremony of Monchon's Markham Senior Care Campus alongside with the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility and a member from Scarborough Agent Court. Our government is proud to allocate and support the 116 new long-term care spaces that this campus will offer to our seniors, Mr. Speaker. In addition to a long-term care center, the senior care campus will also include a live lease unit and a PSW training facility right at this location. Mr. Speaker, we are getting shovels in the ground. Our government will continue to work towards our commitment to deliver 30,000 much-needed long-term care spaces by 2028. After decades of inaction by previous governments, it will be this government, Speaker, that will be the one to fix long-term care and ensure our seniors get the quality of care they need and deserve now and in the future. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next member statement, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. There are many injured workers who have spent many years fighting for their right to receive WSIB compensation. One of these people is Donald. Donald is a 64-year-old man who has laryngeal cancer, skin cancer, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And these are illnesses he got on the job. Donald was a hard-working and eager employee who began working in the concrete and construction industry at 15. At his job, he was exposed to silica dust, muriatic acid, asbestos and many other chemicals. In 2009, he was diagnosed with cancer and forced to stop working. He now uses a stoma and electric larynx to speak. It has taken WSAB 11 years to accept Donald's claim for benefits for an injury he clearly got on the job and during that time he lost his home. Still, the fight is not over. WSIB deemed Donald and cut his payments in half on the basis that he could have been working as a school bus driver. If you're not familiar with the WSIB's practice of deeming, it is when the WSIB pretends a worker has a job that they actually do not have and oftentimes are unable to get in order to reduce and eliminate their benefits. This government has designed WSIB to protect the employer and not help injured workers. And this government is making WSIB worse with Bill 27 by channeling money back to employers instead of providing it to injured workers who are eligible for the program. I am calling on this government to change that to help people like Donald and injured workers across the province. Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Chatham-Kent-Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. On August 26th, in my riding of Chatham-Kent-Leamington in the town of Wheatley, a gas explosion destroyed the downtown area and some residential homes. The explosion is believed to have been caused by the buildup of hydrogen sulfide, which could have been a buildup from the numerous abandoned wells in the community. 2,800-plus residents of the community, now known as Wheatley Strong, has significant financial and emotional damages from the explosion. Fortunately, no one was killed, but 
38 businesses and 68 residential homes were affected. Gas monitoring equipment has been installed to identify any future issues and has since discovered three additional gas leaks. This monitoring provides comfort to those remaining residents who have not yet had to be evacuated but are on standby. The government continues to apply a collaborative, multi-ministry approach to supporting the municipality of Chatham-Kent with the ongoing situation. Wheatley is a strong community coming together and held fundraisers to help those businesses and residents currently displaced. In times of tragedy and greater need, I am grateful for the reinforcement from Premier Ford, Minister Rickford, and the helpful staff from the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Premier Ford provided immediate assistance of $2 million and on a weekly basis remains in touch with the municipality. And on November 17, Minister Rickford announced an additional $3.8 million in financial support, bringing the total funding thus far to $5.8 million. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by sending my thoughts and prayers to the families impacted by the catastrophic flooding in the province of British Columbia. The province is currently dealing with an incredible amount of flooding, and just recently there was an evacuation notice ordered in the Abbotsford area. The Canadian Armed Forces have been deployed to help thousands of stranded residents in the region. On November 17th, BC declared a state of emergency in the province due to mudslides, closures, and crashes happening at an alarming rate. This is devastating news, and I pray for the safety and well-being of the many British Columbians impacted by the flooding. During these unprecedented times, it is important that we stand together in solidarity to support our fellow Canadians. If you have friends or family living in the region, I recommend checking up on loved ones, and if possible, donating to charitable organizations that are providing relief for those affected. Once again, Speaker, this natural disaster has caused pain and suffering for so many Canadians, yet it is truly heartwarming to see humanity come together to help one another. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Member Statements. The Member for Windsor Tecumseh. 26 days until Christmas, and the Speaker says to me, how about a poem? Yes, you, the member for Windsor to come see. Well, I said, maybe a member's statement for you. I could do it, I reckon. And all I need for that is just another 90 seconds. Oh, no, said the clerk and the officers at the table. We have an agenda that's timed and keeps us on track, and the legislature stable. So sorry, but we have absolutely no extra time for Christmas poems and Christmas rhymes. But I say, why are we so punctilious? Why not some time for fun and a bit of poetic silliness? After all, we in this chamber introduced our first poet laureate, a young man named Randell. So maybe, just maybe, more poetry we should always find time to hand out. Hark! The Hansard angels sing. See, he snuck in a poem and the table didn't even seem to notice. So perhaps if he had time to put it to music, it could have been a bit of a minor opus. So my friends, rewind that clock and try to remember that magical time as children each and every December when all of our Christmas dreams were possible. Our imaginations back then really were unstoppable. Just a short trip back in time, and if you listen now, you may hear it. Poetry may have just lifted our Christmas spirit. See, Speaker, there are chuckles and smiles, and for a moment, We've laid down our verbal weapons. And colleagues, we did it all in just about 90 seconds. Thank you to the member for Windsor to come see. His statement, as always, was very Christmassy. Thank you. This is the poem, Next, we have the member for Renfrew, Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. Like it's been this past week has been a stark reminder that while fall was beautiful, winter weather is inevitable. Likely all across the province, but certainly in my riding of Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, people will be navigating in winter conditions for the next several months. I've been around long enough to remember when winter road maintenance was nowhere near the standard we enjoy today, when snowfalls meant that countless vehicles would be stuck, unable to move because the plows hadn't been there yet. 
While our maintenance continues to improve, there are far more vehicles on the road today than when I was a young boy. More vehicles means more opportunities for accidents. One thing hasn't changed. It is the importance of preparation. The more prepared we are for winter weather, the safer we will be. Improvements in tire technology have allowed us to be safer than ever where the rubber meets the road, as they say. I would encourage everyone, as I have for many years, make sure that, make sure that my winter tires are in good shape and ready to face the elements. In addition to properly equipping your vehicle, remember that there is no substitute for driving according to the conditions. The old adage of when it's winter, drive like it's winter, is advice that we all need to take very seriously. Also keep an emergency kit on board, as breakdowns are more common in the winter months. Let's all work together to make sure that we do everything possible to make our highways as safe as they can be this winter. Thank you. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. I'm very pleased to inform the House that one of today's page captains, Paige Athisha Ceres, from the riding of Markham Unionville, um, we have with us at Queen's Park her grandmother, Padmimi Najaram Raja, and her grandfather, Nataraja Thamothar Ab M. P. Lai, and we're also joined today by the mother of page captain Claire Ann from the riding of Don Valley West, Miao Jo. Welcome to Queen's Park. We're delighted to have you here today. <laughs> I understand the government house leader has a point of order. Uh, sorry, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you seek it, you'll find unanimous consent to allow members uh, to make statements in remembrance for the late Mr. Harry Craig Parrott with five minutes allowed to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the, mem to the independent members as a group, and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government. Mr. Calandra is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to make statements in rem remembrance of the late Mr. Harry Craig Parrott with five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. I'll recognize the member for Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. I am honored today on behalf of Andrew Horvath and my NDP colleagues to speak about Harry Parrott. He grew up in a modest home in the small town of Mitchell. He wasn't the only son of Mitchell to go on to become an MPP. Liberal Hugh Edegoffer, a former speaker, came from there as well. While Harry grew up on a farm, Hugh's family was quite well off. They owned a clothing store in Mitchell. In fact, Harry's son Craig, who lives in Windsor, told me Dr. Parrott could never have been afforded to go to school and become a dentist and an orthodontist had it not been for a loan he received from the Edegoffer family. Harry once joked, how Hugh got his politics mixed up, I'm not quite sure. Jumping ahead of myself, Speaker, Harry Parrott and Hugh Edegoffer passed away on the same day, July the 2nd, 2019. Harry Parrott married Isabel, his high school sweetheart, and that marriage lasted 56 years until she passed away in 2003. I first met Harry when I was a reporter with CBC in Windsor. I interviewed him when he was the environment minister back in the days of Premier Bill Davis. His assistant at that time was Janet Ecker, who later would become a conservative MPP and a very powerful cabinet minister. When Harry passed away, Janet wrote that he was one of the finest ministers of the crown she ever had the privilege to work for or serve with, saying a finer gentleman and human being I have yet to meet. Speaker Ms. Ecker says many politicians pay lip service to the concept of public service, but Harry was the real deal. She told me Bill Davis took notice of Harry's real potential when as the Minister of Colleges and Universities, he stood up to a group of protesting students here on the grounds at Queen's Park. That's when Premier Davis decided Harry had what it would take to handle the more demanding role of Minister of the Environment. 
Speaker, the environment was emerging as a very hot topic at the time. The government was trying to locate sites to dispose of liquid industrial waste. Former Liberal leader Dr. Stuart Smith was frequently lambasting the government in question period and in committee. Craig Parrott says, no one could push his father's buttons more so than Stuart Smith. Craig may not have known, but David Warner, Harry's NTP critic at colleges and university, really got under his skin as well one time. And David tells me he takes full blame for this, but he needled him so much at a night sitting Harry actually came around the back, came over and politely offered to David the opportunity to step outside to settle their differences, an offer David very wisely declined. In those days, as you know, Speaker, night sittings were commonplace. If you finished your house duty, you might go up to the press lounge, put the politics aside, have a beer and watch a hockey game together. Janet Ecker told me of the time when the Liberals called the Late Show a debate on an environmental issue, and Harry Parrott questioned the value of even attending. He did, but he argued with Janet about the value of such debates to the average citizen. He saw the late shows as little more than time-consuming political games. Afterwards, on his way to his apartment about 11 o'clock that night, Harry stopped passers-by at Wellesley and Bay, asking if they knew who the environment minister was what environmental issues the legislature had been debating, and whether they even cared. And no one did, Speaker. No one did. Harry decided not to seek re-election in 1981, much to the disappointment of Bill Davis. When I asked Sean Conway, a former Liberal deputy leader, to describe Harry Parrott, he said he was distinguished, thoughtful, results-oriented, and always well-briefed. But, Mr. Conway says, Harry did not enjoy the cut and thrust, the rough and tumble of politics, where at times a minister had to defend the indefensible. Janet Ecker agrees, saying Harry got into politics for all the right reasons and remained true to his principles, knowing he wouldn't be able to serve another term with the passion and integrity that would be required of him. Speaker, Harry Parrott came here because he believed in good ethical government and true public service and working for the best of his community and his province. He once told fellow dentists he took a two-thirds pay cut to become an MPP. Members only earned $18,000 a year back in those days, Speaker, as you know. Harry Parrott was a principled man, and he never took himself too seriously. In fact, he was really quite touched back in 2017 when they named a pumping station in his honor back in his hometown of Mitchell. It wasn't glamorous by any means, but it meant a lot to him as it was a really important piece of municipal infrastructure. Dennis Timbrell was elected in 1971 along with Harry and 27 other brand new PC members. <laughs> he remembers Harry brushing his teeth six or seven times a day as any good dentist was prone to do. Yes, Janet Ecker says, try pripping him for question period while he's more intent of brushing his teeth. Later in cabinet and in the house, Dennis and Harry sat alongside each other, and any time there was an election at any level or a by-election, they would each put up two dollars and make a bet, and they'd stash their betting money beneath the statuette of Sir John A. Macdonald in the cabinet meeting room. When Harry retired, he started dabbling with standard bred horses. His brood mares, and nine years after Isabel died, he eventually moved from Woodstock to Clinton, remarried and bought racehorses with local trainer Jim Watt. And one of those horses stands out, Speaker. Sports line or sporty is exceptional. They had really good offers to sell them, but Harry said, Jim, it would change my life significantly if we sold them. Other than my family, it's the thing that keeps me going. Four days after Harry died, Sporty was racing at Mohawk. He came from behind and he won his ninth race in a row, and that brought his total and purse winnings at that time to $90,000. The racing gods were smiling on Harry Parrott that day, and they continue to do so. Since then, Sportsline has earned more than $210,000 in prize money. Harry Parrott died in his 94th year. He had three children, eight grandchildren, 18 great-grandchildren, and a host of nieces and nephews. 
Our thoughts are with his wife, Donna Wood, and the entire Parrot family. And Speaker, I'm told they're all tuning in virtually today across Ontario and as far away as North Carolina. When he passed, William Rowe wrote, the world could use more hairy parrots, and who among us could disagree? Speaker, thank you for this time today to remember an outstanding former Conservative MPP, Harry Parrott. Thank you very much. Next, we have the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm honoured to stand today to say a few words about Harry Parrott, Member of Provincial Parliament for Oxford. Born on this day in 1925, Mr. Parrott spent his childhood in Mitchell, Ontario. After high school, he started a new chapter in life by attending University of Toronto's Faculty of Dentistry, where his passion for the profession would lead him to postgraduate studies in orthodontics. And although Harry was an orthodontist by profession, he was always deeply rooted in community, volunteering on many boards and committees to help his neighbours. His love for his community ultimately fueled his desire to run for public office. Harry was elected to the Woodstock Public Utility Commission, the Woodstock Board of Education, and, serve, and served on Woodstock City Council for five years. And in 1971, Harry would be elected to this place for the constituency of Oxford in the newly formed Davis government. Early on, Harry would describe himself as an idealistic rookie who occasionally liked to rebel. And after sending some really tough letters to ministers, Harry said he learned how to temper his advocacy for his residents of Oxford. Changes occur slowly, he said. You need a lot of patience. And as a golfer, Harry would learn that lesson inside and outside of this place. Harry would never stop advocating for the residents of Oxford, and within a few years of taking office, had written some 6,000 letters on behalf of his constituents. And despite his early rebellion, after being re-elected in 1975, Premier Davis would ask Harry to join the cabinet as Minister of Colleges and Universities. He'd win again in 1977 and would later be named Minister of the Environment. But Harry wasn't one to stay in one place too often, and even a personal appeal from Premier Davis couldn't get Harry to run again in 1981. His loving wife and high school sweetheart Isabel was said to be beaming at the prospect of having Harry home more often. And upon his retirement, Harry was eager to return to his love of horses and intended to cultivate the life of a Kentucky colonel, he said. In his 94th year, Harry passed away peacefully in 2019. But even in his death, Harry continued to contribute to his community. In October of that year, led by his wife Donna, the family presented a check for $5,000 to the Clinton Public Hospital in memory of Harry. The, don the donation was used towards an accessible shower in the inpatient unit at the hospital. His son, Craig, explained how important the hospital had become to his dad because of the care and nurturing that he had received. He just felt comfortable there, Craig said. We all know, Mr. Speaker, how much time it takes to represent one's neighbours here in this place. Time away from family, away from friends, away from the hobbies and the passions of our lives. It's long been said that the most valuable gift you can give outside of your love is your time, and it's clear that Harry loved his community. To his loving wife, Donna, his children, Craig, Nancy, and Lori, his eight grandkids and 18 great-grandchildren, thank you for sharing Harry with us. The member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I'm honoured today to rise and pay tribute to Harry Craig Parrott, former Conservative MPP and Cabinet Minister for his distinguished public service. And I want to welcome his many family members tuning in today. Uh, Harry was elected to the legislature as an MPP from Oxford in 1971 and served until 1981. In 1975, he was appointed cabinet minister for Minister of Colleges and Universities, and in August 1978, he was elected or appointed as Ontario's sixth Minister of the Environment. As Minister of Environment, he led the charge in helping tackle acid rain in the late 1970s, including imposing control orders on INCO as a result of acid rain from coal-fired plants in Sudbury. His waste bill was known as the Spills Bill, 
and established one of the first principles of polluter pays from the Ministry of Environment. Uh, I was reading through the Hansard, and shortly after he was appointed Minister of the Environment, he reported back to the House on signing an update to the International Joint Commission protecting the Great Lakes. And during debate, an opposition member interjected and said, oh, you all said this 10 years ago. Why are you still talking about pollution in the Great Lakes? And like a great Canadian, Harry said, it's all because of the United States and the pollution they're putting into the Great Lakes. We're doing great things here in Canada. Uh, Harry, <laughs> Harry um, according to the London Free Press, they described him as someone who believed that one person can affect change in society. And without a doubt, Harry Parrott affected change in society. He's left a lasting legacy for Ontarians to be proud of, and I want to thank his family for sharing Harry with us. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next, I'll recognize the member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and I'm honoured to have the opportunity to pay tribute to the public service of Dr. Harry C. Parrott. He represented Oxford here in the Ontario Legislature from 1971 to 1981. Harry passed away July 2, 2019, at the, 2019 at the age of 93. It's my pleasure to share a bit of the selfless contributions Harry made to his local community and our province. It's my hope that members of Harry's family understand what an important role he played. Every politician's family faces a period of adjustment when their loved one is elected to public office. They're often gone for periods of time, and when they are home, they are calls and correspondence, as we heard about the thousands of letters that Harry wrote. We want Harry's family to know what they sacrificed in order that, they may have, that he may have served the public is not forgotten. When he was elected, Harry committed to 10 years. He wanted to be in government long enough to be able to make a difference. Harry did make a difference, not only at Queen's Park, but also in a variety of positions over the years. After graduating from the University of Toronto, in 1947, Harry married his high school sweetheart, Isabel Walker, from her hometown of Mitchell. They settled in Woodstock, and together through 56 years of marriage, they raised three children, Greg, Nancy, and Lori. It was their hard work and support as a family at home that allowed Harry to give his full attention to provincial duties. As their children had families of their own, Harry and Isabel were blessed with eight grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren. Harry practiced dentistry and later orthodontics in Woodstock. During this time, he was very involved in the community and began his legacy of public service. Harry was elected as a member of the Woodstock City Council for five years. Um, Woodstock Board of Education, three years. Woodstock Public Utility Commission for three years. He also served as president of Oxford County Red Cross and was campaign chair for Woodstock United Appeal. He served on several local committees and supported many initiatives and charities. As busy as Harry was, Harry always made time to enjoy his family, play a round of golf, and work his standard bred horses. Harry was a down-to-earth and well-liked. I believe that's a large part of why the people elected him as MPP in 1971, provincial election. He's been described as a thoroughly decent fellow who had a distinguished manner about him, and he certainly had a presence. You could tell Harry was proud of Oxford and humbled to be a representative for Queen's Park. During one budget debate, he wandered a little bit off script in a word and put in a word for the riding. He said, and I quote, it is an excellent county. It probably represents, as well as any riding, the backbone of the history of this province. It has a great heritage in the agriculture community, and I think it has justifiably earned that reputation over the many years. Harry was our MPP when the government passed the act to restructure Oxford County from 11 municipalities to eight in order to simplify the structure of local government. He held many roles during his time serving the province. He was a member of several committees and appointed Minister of Colleges and Universities from 1975 to 1978. 
Mr. Speaker, Harry was also very pro-environment, so it was ideal that Harry was appointed Minister of the Environment from 1978 to 1981. It was during that time that Harry's environmental policies guided Oxford County's search for a new municipal landfill site. Not a popular thing at home. He was the driver of the development of the province's first liquid industrial waste treatment and disposal complex and felt that these projects were important parts of his contribution to the relative, relatively new ministry. His legacy as Ministry of the Environment came up during the debate in 1983 when it was said that in 1978, Dr. Harry Parrott was very proud to release a small blue book under his name called Water Management. That booklet, he revised and expanded on it, it was revised and expanded on guidelines and criteria for water quality management. This booklet is still available digitally in digital form in the Legislative Library collection. His hometown, Mitchell, recognized Harry in 2017 by naming a municipal pumping station after him. Harry was proud to attend that naming ceremony with the members of his family. In the many wonderful tributes posted on Harry's obituary, Janet Ecker wrote that she worked for Harry's staff when he was the Minister of Environment. She wrote, and I quote, a finer gentleman and human being I have yet to meet. I learned a great deal from him, not just about life, but how to truly be a public servant." End of quote. Former MPP Norm Sterling also left his remarks on Harry's obituary. He had the utmost respect for Harry, describing him as kind, intelligent, and a pleasure to work with. Throughout Norm's 34 years in the legislature, he often thought of Harry's honesty and his respect for others. Harry was an example that Norm tried to follow as many others in the legislature. I myself was fortunate to benefit from Harry's counsel. I was preparing, as I, when I was preparing to run for the provincial election in 1995, I went to talk to Harry to get his advice. After all, he was the expert. Harry told me there are two women I had to meet. He would be able to help me with, that would be able to help me win the election. And he even offered to introduce me to them. That's when he, Harry introduced his two daughters, Nancy and Lori, who helped me in my first campaign, or you might say they directed my first campaign. Their hard work and experience they had in getting their father elected uh, as much, was much appreciated, and I started my career in provincial government. Harry was always supportive and could be counted on to provide sound advice when asked. When Isabel passed away in 2003, Harry moved on. He moved on so far that he ended up in Clinton, where he married Donna Wood. They met through their shared interest in horse racing and continued to enjoy the sport for many years. Shortly after Harry's death, his family made a donation in his name to the Clinton Public Hospital. They were all on hand for the presentation, which was a cause dear to Donna who was very involved in keeping the hospital in the community, and to Harry because of the great care he received there. He was raised in Perth, Wellington, and retired in Huron, Bruce, but we are proud to have Dr. Harry Parrott serve Oxford for as long as he did. We thank his family support for supporting him along the way. Oxford is a better place because Harry Parrott made it that way. Thank you very much. We give thanks to uh, the family of Harry Parrott and we're grateful for his life and his public service.